Samuel Bodman today rejected the idea of releasing oil from U.S. strategic reserves, saying increased demand is the cause of rising gas prices, not market speculation. He testified before the House Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. This is two hours. Good morning. This is um, the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. We welcome you all to uh, this very important uh, hearing with the Secretary of Energy, Samuel Bodman. Uh, less than three months ago, when asked by reporters about predictions that gas prices would rise to $4 per gallon, President Bush admitted that he had not heard those forecasts. Well, for millions of consumers in New York and California, Chicago, all across America, $4 gas is now a reality. Gas prices have now reached a record nationwide average of $3.81 per gallon, up more than 160 percent since President Bush took office, increasing on average by 34 cents a gallon each year of the Bush administration. The price of oil has also skyrocketed. A few years ago, people scoffed at the prospect of $100 oil. But American consumers have now seen an increase of $100 per barrel in the price of oil since President Bush took office. The incredible escalation of gas and oil prices is not an accident. It is the result of more than seven years of this administration pushing an energy policy solely focused on fossil fuels. One of the Bush administration's first major actions was to convene the secret Cheney Energy Task Force, comprised of cabinet level and other senior administration officials meeting in closed door <coughs> sessions with big oil and other industries. Not surprisingly, the recommendations from this clandestine group focused on more oil and gas drilling. On January 29, 2001, the day of the first meeting of the Cheney Energy Task Force, the price of oil was $32 per barrel. The Bush administration and the Republican Congress then passed an energy bill in 2005 that gave billions of dollars in tax breaks and subsidies to the oil, coal, nuclear, and gas industries. On August 8, 2005, when President Bush signed the Republican energy bill into law, the price of oil was $64 per barrel. And over the last seven years, the Bush administration has offered big oil the rights to drill on more than 268 million acres of public land offshore. Oil companies now own the drilling rights to more land then they know what to do with. In fact, Big Oil currently holds more than 30 million acres, both onshore and offshore, that aren't even being used. But last week, on May 17, as the price of oil stood at $126 per barrel, President Bush once again echoed the tired refrain we have heard for the last seven years, that we must increase our domestic oil exploration. The price of oil is now $135 per barrel. After seven years of filling our tanks with record high gas and filling the calendar with new records for the price of oil, it is time to stop giving gifts to big oil. In the last 16 months since the Democrats took control of the Congress, we have passed legislation not only to provide consumers with immediate relief at the pump, but also to reduce our oil dependence in the long term. Last year, the Democratic Congress passed an energy bill that, by 2030, will reduce our consumption of oil by nearly 3 million barrels per day. And last week, the Democratic Congress passed legislation that required the Department of Energy to stop purchasing oil at record prices to fill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. But the Bush administration can and must do more to help American families right now. In a fire, you are supposed to stop drop and roll. And when it comes to using the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to help the consumers in an energy emergency, the President should stop, swap and sell. The President must deploy, must sell the oil from the Petroleum Reserve, which 
has a proven track, track record of success in bringing down prices. Putting more oil into the global marketplace is the step which will send a signal that we are serious uh, about uh, reducing the price of oil globally. The administration has no problem deploying our National Guard reserves to Iraq, but to continue to refuse to deploy our oil reserves to help consumers this summer, uh, the President says no. This weekend is the start of the summer driving season, but the Bush administration refuses to take any action that would stop driving up oil and gas prices. American families are begging for help from high energy prices, and it is time for this administration to finally heed that call. That completes the opening statement of the Chair. I now turn to recognize the gentleman uh, from Wisconsin, the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Now, uh, my hearing aid was on during your discussion, and it seems to me that in our three branches of government, uh, the Congress has got some responsibility, too. And with gas prices rising through the roof, signs that energy costs will rise even higher, now is the time for leadership. The Democrats today are calling for leadership from the administration. But it is Congress's job to set policy, to make important policy changes, and to make sure that those changes will result in lower fuel and electricity costs. So far, the Democratic leadership has not taken that job seriously, especially when it comes to gas prices. Instead of solutions to the nation's high energy prices, the House leadership has given the American people the Pelosi premium. Since taking control of Congress in January 2007, gas prices have risen more than a dollar and a half a gallon in Wisconsin under Speaker Nancy Pelosi's watch despite her promise of a common-sense plan to lower gas prices. There has been a lot of talk from the Democratic leadership about windmills and solar panels, but those technologies are better suited for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, not energy prices. A recent report from Secretary Bodman's own Energy Information Administration shows that while solar power receives government subsidies excuse me, totaling about $24 per megawatt hour, and wind power receives about $23 in subsidies, coal power receives just 44 cents, and natural gas just gets a quarter. While there are benefits to wind and solar power, coal and natural gas are the best options for expanding electricity production at reasonable cost. I think the American people's number one priority for Congress is lowering fuel and electricity costs, and Republicans are committed to doing that. When it comes to gasoline, Democrats have focused on fuel standards and ethanol. Higher fuel standards do have the potential to help lower fuel demand in the long run, but the American people need help now. Ethanol has caused more harm than good as both food and gas prices continue to rise. That is why I am supporting legislation that will repeal the subsidies and tariffs for ethanol and end this boondoggle, which I think, using a Democrat term, can best be described as corporate welfare. And while Democrats will blame energy costs on the President, the facts are clear. In the period between January 2001 and January 2007, before the Democrats assumed leadership in Congress, gas prices rose 84 cents a gallon, which is a significant jump, but nothing compared to the Pelosi premium of more than a dollar and a half in just 18 months. With neither a common sense plan in sight from the Democratic leadership nor an end to high gas prices, House Republicans are hearing the cries of the American people and putting forth our own plans, which are truly common sense. We will expand production of American oil and gas and do so in an environmentally safe way. There are billions of barrels of untapped oil that can be recovered without harming the environment. Nearly 85 percent of the offshore oil and gas fields are untapped because Congress has placed them off limits. Additionally, we must expand the refining capacity in the United States if we are going to continue to meet the surging demand for gasoline. The House Republicans' broad plan will also encourage the expansion of nuclear power, which is a technology that stands to greatly improve U.S. energy independence and greenhouse gas reductions. House Republicans will also push for greater energy efficiency by supporting conservation tax incentives to Americans who make their homes, cars and businesses more energy efficient. 
And despite their costs, House Republicans also know there are great benefits to solar, wind, hydroelectric, and other sources of renewable energy, and will continue to support further development of these technologies. The primary difference between Republicans and Democrats on the issue is that House Republicans want to explore all the options that are on the table, while Democrats want to pick winners and losers. That plan hasn't worked in the past, and it won't work now. House Republicans are also pushing a plan that can help get energy costs under control. These are the kinds of policies that the Democratic leadership should be supporting, too. But sadly, this kind of leadership is lacking in this 110th Congress, and for the sake of all Americans, Republican and Democrat, that's a shame. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm a little vexed uh, that we uh, have my, my friend from uh, Wisconsin concerned about a so-called Pelosi premium. Uh, when, in fact, what we are seeing is the culmination of uh, the policies that have been put in place, a compliant Congress doing what the Republican administration has wanted to do over the course of the last six years. Um, and I particularly am interested in this canard that somehow we have got to open up some of the most pristine and uh, delicate uh, areas, like the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, when there are already of the 42 million acres of Federal land currently leased by oil and gas companies, only about 12 million are currently uh, drilled to produce oil and gas now. According to the Federal Government's own surveys, 82 percent of the gas in the Outer Continental Shelf and 79 percent of the oil is available uh, for leasing. And this is before uh, the Republican Congress opened more space in the Gulf of Mexico for drilling in 2006. Uh, the <laughs> fundamental problem here is that the United States, with 2 percent of the world's oil reserves and using 25 percent of the world's uh, oil, cannot continue to waste more oil than any country in the world, and that we are not going to drill our way out of this problem. Uh, I think having a comprehensive energy approach, as we have been looking at on this committee, is part of it. I look forward to uh, exploring with the Secretary, uh, as we move forward, uh, some of the, uh, the trade-offs here in terms of, how, of the policies being working and what the implications are for their success or failure. But the in the final analysis, it is not simply uh, uh, something that we are going to be able to do by ignoring the realities. We have a small amount of a declining resource. We are going to have to be able to be more efficient and give the American consumers more choices, not simply uh, broaden the field for the oil companies that aren't already using uh, the total amount that has been given to them uh, that is at their disposal. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for holding this hearing. It is important to have this discussion. As you can see, uh, we have quite a wide divide uh, in views on this issue. Uh, I am very pleased that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, pushed to open the Strategic Petroleum Re Reserve and to uh, not add additional oil to the reserve at the moment, uh, and even uh, hopefully to press to release some oil from that reserve. Uh, I am also supportive of legislation that would say we should take, uh, we, we should be replacing some of the uh, heavy for light uh, uh, oil that we are putting into the reserve. But I think it is very important to understand why that is so critical. Uh, although the Strategic Petroleum Reserve represents only one tenth of one percent, some experts have pointed out that at somewhere between 20 percent and 40 percent of the current cost of gasoline could be driven by speculation. And the argument goes that if we were to open the SPRO uh, or stop putting oil in it, that might send a price signal to the speculators and they might stop speculating. Uh, the important part for that discussion is that it demonstrates that those who advocate that we don't put any more oil into the SPRO right now understand that there is a link between supply and price, because their argument is, look, by putting oil into the SPRO, we are reducing the supply for public consumption and that is driving up cost and increasing speculation. If there is a link between supply and price, then we have to examine the policies of this Congress. I have been a member now for uh, going on 14 years, and over that 14 years, we have, have had vote after vote after vote after vote after vote uh, on the issue of 
either increasing domestic supply or cutting off domestic supply, either opening further areas for exploration and production or restricting further areas for exploration or production. And in vote after vote after vote, we have decided to not increase domestic production. We have decided to limit areas for exploration. Uh, just, uh, I believe, two years ago, uh, there was legislation contemplated to expand production off the Outer Continental Shelf. Uh, the idea was to give the states a voice in that issue and to place the drilling rigs at least 50 miles offshore where they couldn't be seen. Uh, and we not only didn't pass it for oil, we didn't enact it for uh, natural gas. Just a few months ago, last summer, uh, the majority party imposed a moratorium on oil shale. There is a fact here, and that is this Congress has created this crisis by restricting supply. Everybody agrees that in the long term we have to pursue alternatives. Uh, I would simply say that in the short term uh, we cannot continue to restrict supply in the Outer Continental Shelf, in the Inner Mountain West, for oil shale or for ANWR, and expect prices not to go up. And I thank the Chairman for holding the hearing. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. I was at a meeting in Napa, California a couple weekends ago uh, of a bunch of venture capitalists and CEOs of some really exciting American businesses that are developing really truly alternative energy sources. And, and so there was some talk about this issue that people thought this was such a silly debate back in Washington, D.C about whether or not we could reduce gas prices by opening up some of the areas that we currently use for, for our pristine areas like the Arctic. And folks pointed out that it was really a kind of a silly debate because the fact of the matter is, is somehow our dinosaurs got planted under somebody else's sand. And I'm not blaming the Bush administration for that. The fact of the matter is the oil is just not there to have any appreciable impact on world oil prices. And no matter what we do, a barrel of oil is a, is a worldwide market that is determined by worldwide supply and demand. We use 25 percent of the world's oil. We have less than 3 percent of the world's oil supply. Mr. Bodman in his testimony talked about if we opened up every spigot in Yellowstone and the Arctic and Mount Rainier National Park, we could maybe increase our domestic oil supplies by 20 percent. That's a worldwide increase of 0.6 percent increase of worldwide oil supplies that will have virtually no impact on oil worldwide barrel of oil prices. And the fact of the matter is we could drill on the National Mall and the oil price of a barrel of oil is still going to be over $130 a barrel. Now, there are some things we can do about the speculative market. But what we really need to do is to get our cars to drive on something in oil. I met a guy out in Napa, a guy named Shai Agassi. Young guys, I don't know, 35, 36 years old. Now, here's a guy we ought to be listening to. He signed a contract to totally electrify all the cars in Israel and soon Denmark. This is what we should be thinking about. We got to get off of oil ultimately in our cars. When we do that, then we'll have a transportation system that's efficient. We got to think a lot bolder than we have been. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the hearing. Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us this morning. It's so interesting to sit here and think what the American people must think as they are listening to these opening statements. Uh, one of the things that we hear from constituents, they think that Congress doesn't have, and the leadership in Congress doesn't have an energy plan. They are looking at what has happened in the past two years to a barrel of crude when it's gone from 55 to $130 a barrel. Um, as someone had mentioned earlier, the price of that barrel, and when I was preparing Sorry. for the hearing, Mr. Chairman, we went back and looked, and the price uh, on a barrel when President Bush took office was $30 a barrel. It varied very little until 2004 when we saw growth in the Indian and China economies. And then it really did not start to accelerate until early 2007. And the acceleration has been from that $55 mark to $130. And that has been in less than two years. So I do think that's noteworthy. Now, when we were doing the Energy Policy Act of 05, one of the items we discussed was getting that bill had taken a, a six-year period of time to come to agreement. 
And uh, there have been many times that this side of the aisle that we Republicans have pushed to address the supply and the capacity issue. We did it in the 05 Act. We had a bill that followed the 05 Act in uh, October of 05 that dealt with that issue. Uh, we had pressure from uh, the Democrat side of the aisle to not address those uh, capacity and supply issues. And what we know is that our constituents and the American people want to see this issue solved. To address the price at the pump today, we are going to have to talk about supply, capacity, about energy exploration, about energy independence, and um, begin to look at what we do in the short term the mid-range and the long-term on these issues. Uh, Americans want American solutions. We are the most innovative people. We certainly can figure this one out. <coughs> we know that uh, there are barriers that have been placed in front of uh, extraction, in front of exploration. Mr. Chairman, we need to remove those barriers get the price down at the pump, and have a long-term plan. And I okay. yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I have to suspend belief to when you listen to our distinguished colleagues on the other side. And I think it was called the Pelosi premium. Yep. I didn't realize that Nancy Pelosi was in those behind closed doors meeting with Jick Cheney as they were putting together the master plan for their energy strategy that is in its current eighth year. I, you know, I didn't realize she was in on those meetings, but perhaps I'm wrong. Our colleagues who used to be known as the uh, grand old party are giving new meaning to GOP primarily in as much as they have become to mean gas, oil, and petroleum, and protecting those interests at all costs. You have to suspend your belief, because I think our colleagues over here have been a little bit unfair. They do have a policy, an energy policy, and Thomas Friedman has talked about it frequently. It's called leave no moolah behind, <laughs> because what we end up doing is by the monies that we're sending overseas, that work their ways through the massages and into the hands of the very people that are assaulting and killing our men and women over in the Middle East. And meanwhile, as gas prices continue to go up because of policies that were made behind closed doors with no oversight and review, with speculators that are running unbridled and over the counter with, a, with, with an invisible market where they're able to jack the price up minimally 10 to 40 percent so that people in my district who get their Social Security check have to sign it over to the oil dealer to pay for their heating of their homes. This was the work of Nancy Pelosi, I'm told. This is the work of an administration that hasn't had a policy and people on the other side of this aisle who continue to block initiatives that would otherwise lead to our independence and non-reliance on the Middle East for foreign oil and embrace the alternatives that we know will provide a greener environment, the jobs that we need, and get away from this path that we've followed down. And with that, Mr. Chairman, though I could speak from several more minutes, I reserve my time. That would be the Irish side of the gentleman, not the Swedish that would like to speak longer, and I appreciate it. Um, the gentleman, uh, gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis, recognized. It's going to be really hard to follow. <laughs> but I, too, want to join my colleagues here and, and uh, thank uh, our Chairman Markey for having this important hearing. It's uh, nice to have you here with us, Secretary. As you know, you can hear our frustration. and. Um, I guess my concern, again, is um, in your testimony, you, you believe that we can do more here. We can actually cultivate more energy resources by drilling and opening up uh, previous leases along our coast and what have you. Well, that's, that's a no-starter for many of us. So how could we really talk 
uh, candidly and, and really talk about exploring uh, renewable energies and investment in home resources here in, in the United States. And yesterday, uh, most of my colleagues, I think, on the dais here supported uh, renew, you know, renewing uh, credits, tax credits, so that we can invest in solar energy and renewable energy. We need to do more, and I, I just am waiting to see what incentives and uh, innovative ideas that uh, your office and through your leadership can provide. Um, every day that we go home to our districts, every weekend at least, um, that uh, gas price keeps inching up. In my district now in Los Angeles, it's been over, well over four dollars for the last three weeks if not a month, and uh, that doesn't even explain um, the other costs that are being applied to uh, consumers when they go to the grocery store because all the uh, diesel fuel also has, has gone up dramatically and it hits very hard upon our low income, uh, working class, blue collar communities that right now we seem to be ignoring. And, and I'm standing up for that little guy and that little woman out there that's trying to make it to uh, school to take her children or to make it to her part-time job that uh, really has no voice at this table. And I'm hoping that there's something realistically that we can do other than just um, holding our hands up and saying, well, gee, we can't get the uh, oil corporations to do anything about it. And oh my God, we pay so much in taxes. Well, Jesus, when you talk to the regular Joe or Mary on the street, they're saying the same thing. And our frustration is very, very real. This economy, we don't have support by the American public. The direction is wrong. Um, and one of it hits home very clearly, and that's in our pocketbook. When we go home to our districts, whether it's in California, whether it's in New York, Miami, Florida, or in Texas. So I would just hope you could hit enlighten um, this committee with some uh, innovative ideas. Thank you. General lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the general lady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Sandler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, welcome. Uh, if you look at my district, the entire state of South Dakota, from end to end, whether it's our vast fields of corn and soybeans on the eastern side of the state, wind across every part of the state, and the great forests of the Black Hills in the west, South Dakota embodies the idea that we need a diversified approach to our national energy policy. And in particular, we need to take advantage, as Ms. Solis was saying, of new opportunities for renewable energy. So as we strive to meet our national energy needs, uh, we must continue to recognize, I think, that rural America uh, has much to offer, and rural states should be at the center of the solution as our national energy policy shifts and adjusts in ways that can enhance our national and economic security, promote innovation and conservation, and ultimately ease the strain on the budgets of families and businesses. Now, with the passage of the original re renewable fuel standard in 2005 and then the aggressive increase included in last year's energy bill, we've already taken some initial key steps in the right direction as we seek to take advantage of the contribution of agricultural producers in rural states uh, to reduce our dependence on foreign oil and the overall carbon emissions through an increase in production of biofuels wind and other types of renewable energy. I respectfully disagree with the ranking member, the gentleman from Wisconsin, on the impact of ethanol. Ethanol has kept gas prices from going even further, upwards of 15 percent higher than they are today, and the price of corn to make ethanol has very little to do with the increase in food prices when compared to other factors like the cost of energy and the processing and transportation of food. Uh, so I look forward to your testimony on these and other issues, in particular infrastructure issues for the transmission of wind energy. Uh, thank you for being here, and I yield back. General lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, uh, Chairman Markey uh, and uh, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, the Secretary uh, to this hearing. Uh, it is difficult to refute our current administration's poor record on environmental protection and renewable energy promotion. For example, uh, the administration has consistently lobbied for drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge as if the um, oil there contains uh, gold-plated gas, which would solve our growing greed uh, for gasoline. The administration has also continued to support the oil and gas industry in terms of subsidies. Alcoholic Anonymous does not encourage its participants to visit more bars as a means of reducing their dependence on alcohol. Likewise, the solution for our energy crisis is not 
more drilling. For this reason, Congress is attempting to change the course of American energy policy by passing meaningful and effective legislation. Just this week, the House passed H.R. 6049, the Energy and Tax Extenders Act of 2008. If it becomes law, this important bill will extend expiring tax provisions for renewable energy production and energy conservation. The progressive Pelosi policy has promoted renewable sources of energy and energy efficiency and conservation. But we must have support from the current administration if we are to be truly successful. And I hope, Mr. Secretary, that you can offer some insight into the policies promoted by this administration and that we can work together to the extent possible to reach energy independence and achieve a cleaner environment for all Americans. Thank you for being here. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Great gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York State, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. Um, America is clearly at an energy crossroads, and uh, one look at oil costs or conversations with families in my district or others around the country who are being forced to sacrifice more to keep on the lights and the heat and the fuel in their vehicles uh, is uh, all the evidence one would need uh, to come to that conclusion. It's our job in Congress to look at how we got here, what our government is doing to solve the crisis, and uh, I'm disappointed that when one looks back over the last seven years, it's apparent that the administration has pursued what I see as sort of a lose, lose, lose policy where we are shipping more and more of our dollars to uh, unstable uh, countries and un unstable parts of the world uh, where they are used, as one of the other members mentioned, to uh, fund, uh, in part, to fund madrasas or arming of, uh, of these uh, governments who we may have disagreements with about human rights or other uh, foreign uh, relations issues, and then borrowing that money because we are running a, a deficit at the same time uh, and a balance of trade deficit. We are basically borrowing the money from other countries and finding ourselves losing our, losing our sovereignty, so it is lose, lose, lose policy. And I would like to see us move toward or the win, win, win policy where we are developing the new technologies that provide jobs here and keep our dollars here uh, in this country and at the same time get us our, uh, our sovereignty back. Uh, this is not an ideological uh, statement. It is an empirical one looking at oil prices that are breaking daily records, hitting $135 per barrel overnight. Gas prices have more than doubled since 2001. In New York, they are over $4 a gallon. Um, until recently, the administration has shown resistance to providing short-term relief through timely use of the SPR. And I am glad that the administration has now chosen to agree with Congress on this issue and halt deliveries to the SPR to provide some relief on the demand side. Um, however, the long-term solutions to our energy prices remain somehow inexplicably tied to a drill first, ask questions later mentality. While private investment is driving renewables by wind and solar to grow by leaps and bounds, we are somehow uh, being told that we really need to, to keep trying to bring them along uh, and at the same time throw more money uh, at the oil uh, industry as the uh, Energy Act of 2005 did with subsidies that uh, we have been trying to uh, to uh, take back tax breaks to an industry that is already uh, claiming record profits uh, and also throwing more money down the nuclear rabbit hole, uh, dozens of years and billions of dollars in taxpayer finance largesse. And I just would comment that uh, I think the ranking member said we shouldn't be picking winners and losers. We have always picked winners and losers. We, we, the taxpayer is the insurance company that uh, indemnifies the nuclear industry since the Price-Anderson Act, for instance. So uh, the question is what, not whether we pick winners or losers, but whether, whether we pick the right ones. Uh, the path we need to follow is one that has been advocated by this Congress, focuses on green, domestic, innovative solutions that will reduce our reliance on old forms of energy and drive rather than drain our economy. I remain an optimist, and I hope that even in its last six months, the Bush administration can turn a corner and join with Congress to realign the priorities that meet this vision. And I yield back. Okay, gentlemen's uh, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Bodden, for agreeing to come to talk to us today. Um, in this committee, we are taking a broad look at all our options to reduce our dependence on imported oil. Uh, we have uh, seen the benefits of pursuing renewable energies and the startling savings that are available through energy efficiency measures. 
Uh, I'm concerned that despite the administration's rhetoric, the only action that we've seen uh, is the push for more domestic drilling, including going to the length of preventing my state of California from requiring our vehicles in California to have more fuel efficiency. You know, I've had an, a constituent you literally yell at me in my face last weekend because he was so humiliated to see the President go hat in hand to Middle Eastern countries to beg for oil. I agree with that sentiment. Uh, and I implore this administration to take real steps toward attaining, um, in, uh, toward attaining independence by allowing states to lead the way. Uh, Mr. Bodden, thanks again for coming. Uh, let's stop the rhetoric and start working together to find solutions. Uh, and uh, I look forward to your testimony. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. All time for opening statements from the uh, committee members has expired. And we turn to our uh, witness, the uh, Honorable Samuel Bodman, who is the Secretary of the Department of Energy. Um, Secretary Bodman has led the Department of Energy since February of 2005. Uh, he also served in the administration as uh, Deputy Secretary uh, of Treasury. Uh, and the Department of uh, Commerce. Uh, he was also the CEO of Fidelity uh, and also the Cabot Corporation, both up in Boston. And we welcome you, Mr. Secretary. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Chairman Markey, Congressman Sensenbrenner, uh, members of the committee, uh, I uh, want to thank you all for providing me the opportunity to uh, speak with you about America's energy and environmental challenges. These are very serious issues in my judgment. They're deserving of serious consideration, which in my judgment begins with the recognition that distinct energy challenges and unique constraints are creating a new global energy reality. Our response to this new reality is based on the fundamental premise that energy insecurity poses an unacceptable risk to the United States national security and our economy. Implicit in the new energy reality is the recognition that energy issues must be assessed and addressed in a global construct. Today, coal produced in South America is used to generate electricity in Europe. Oil drawn from Africa is used to power cars in Asia. Liquefied natural gas from Trinidad powers homes and businesses in the United States. America can no longer consider its energy security as largely a domestic issue. To illustrate what I'm talking about, consider this new reality's three underlying causes. One, an extraordinary surge in global energy demand. Two, resource limitations coupled with increasing geopolitical instability. And three, the likelihood that some type of carbon constraints are an eventual part of the world's energy future. These challenges, the, the challenges that these underlying causes present are considerable and the administration, in my view, has been quite vigorous in its efforts to address them. This administration has, since 2001, spent more than $22 billion to research, to develop, and to promote alternative energy sources, and to reduce energy demand. In 2006, the President produced, uh, proposed the Advanced Energy Initiative as a comprehensive plan to change the way that we power our homes, our businesses, and our automobiles. The Department of Energy is moving ahead with a loan guarantee program that will assist in the development and commercialization of clean alternative energies that, uh, by systems that are providing up to $42 billion in loan guarantees. These initiatives, coupled with our other efforts, have led us to an approach which I believe can be distilled into four principal areas of focus. One, the development of energy from a more diverse set of sources, such as oil shale and advanced biofuels, 
coupled with efforts to expand production on traditional forms of energy into areas such as the Arctic National Wildlife Ref Refuge and the Outer Continental Shelf. The development and deployment of innovative technologies, such as those pursued by the Department's Vehicles Technologies and Building Technologies programs. These programs provide producers and consumers with ways to substantially increase energy efficiency at all levels of economic activity. Three, the development and deployment of low carbon or no carbon energy technologies such as carbon capture and storage, wind, solar, and clean, safe nuclear power. And four, the development and deployment of an expanded U.S. energy infrastructure to include additional refineries, expedited siting for pipelines and improvements to the electrical grid in order to handle the need for increased capacity safely and securely. Any one of these areas that I named those of those four areas requires considerable commitment. Together they represent an opportunity for this nation to excel and to lead. I continue to be confident that we are laying the groundwork necessary for investment and innovation to occur. The results are not going to be immediate, but our efforts eventually will come together to increase America's energy security and to provide economic relief to the U.S. taxpayer. In addition, they will provide environmental relief by changing the impact of our energy consumption and altering the ways in which we produce energy. To that end, between 2001 and 2008, this administration has invested more than $45 billion toward activities related to climate change science and technology. In April of this year, the President set a new national goal for stopping the growth of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2025. But that reduction in emissions will take place only so long as the necessary technology continues to advance, which is an important mission for this Department. It will require the cooperation of the world's major economies, an effort that the President proposed and is leading, and the cooperation of Congress, state and local governments, businesses, entrepreneurs, investors, as well as academia. In my judgment, there is considerable reason for optimism. Having spent many years in the nation's financial sector, I can honestly say for the, that for the first time in history, we are seeing the venture capital community putting sizable amounts of money into entrepreneurial companies in the alternative energy business. One recent industry report showed that the so-called clean tech sector which includes renewable energy and efficiency technologies, experienced record venture capital investment levels of $2.2 billion in the year 2007, up from just $500 million in the year 2005. That, by almost any measure, is quite remarkable in terms of its growth. Mr. Chairman, each of us in in my view, has a, has a part to play in increasing America's energy security. Developing new technologies is not enough. Implementing new policies is not enough. And it is not enough to simply devise new incentive schemes or to open new areas for production. All of these can and should contribute to increased U.S. energy security, and they must be done in concert with one another. They must be pursued with an understanding of the facts of the new energy reality. Our economic and national security future is largely dependent upon our energy future. Mr. Chairman, at this time I would like to conclude my remarks by asking that my written uh, testimony be, be uh, a copy which I think has already been uh, provided, uh, that that be entered into the record. And I'd be happy to respond to any questions. That Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And without uh, objection, the Secretary's entire uh, testimony will be uh, entered into the record at this uh, point. Uh, the Chair now recognizes himself for a round of questions. Um, Mr. Secretary, 
And we know that swapping and releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, has a proven historical track record of success. Uh, President Bush's father uh, in 1991 uh, deployed the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Prices dropped by one-third. Uh, when President Clinton deployed the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, prices dropped by 18 uh, percent. Uh, and when President Bush deployed it after Hurricane Katrina, uh, there was a reduction of 9.1 percent. Why uh, is President Bush refusing to uh, answer uh, this uh, historical challenge by deploying the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, by now sending uh, millions of oil, uh, millions of barrels of oil uh, out into the open uh, marketplace? Uh, that will have, obviously, looking at the historical record, a depressing effect upon the price of oil. Well, the goal, uh, Mr. Chairman, is to provide security for this country. That is what the purpose of the SPRO is. And uh, the SPRO is there. It is meant to deal with matters where we have the physical uh, delay, the interruption of the flow of oil. Uh, to our country. We don't have that issue today, and that is the reason. Well, we did not have that in 1991. We did not have that in, uh, 19, uh, in the year 2000 when President Clinton deployed it. We did not have that, uh, in fact, when uh, the President deployed the SPRO after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, course, in each of one of those did. situations, there was not an international um, uh, a crisis that uh, was uh, going to have some permanent effect upon our, our, um, uh, our access to oil. You, you understand what I am saying here? What we have got here is last Friday President Bush asking the Saudis to please produce more oil because it would have uh, an effect on reducing the price of oil for American consumers. Well, I the Saudis said no. But we have 700 million barrels of oil stored that are ready to be deployed um, that will have the same effect if President Bush was willing to uh, use it right now because of the speculation in the, oil in the oil marketplace that nothing is going to happen. Why won't you recommend to President Bush that he deploy the Strategic Petroleum Re Reserve given the historical successful record? I don't know how to be clear with you, sir. First of all, there was in 2005, I don't know about the other cases, but there certainly was an interruption of supply that was caused by the hurricanes. And uh, that we had requests uh, for the availability of oil and uh, we responded with well, the don't you believe? Don't oil. you believe that there is now rampant speculation going on in the oil futures marketplace no, that don't. is artificially driving the price up no, exponentially almost on a daily basis? I don't. No, I don't. You don't believe this no, speculation no. right now? You I don't think, believe that this is just a... Let me explain why, if I may. Sure. Um, we've, uh, the, the, if you look back over the history of oil production globally, it increased by about a million barrels per day per year, so that each year as you moved along, it increased by roughly a million barrels a day until you got to the year 2004. In the year 2004, we had almost an increase of 3 million barrels a day of consumption. In the year 2005, 6, and 7, we have had flat production. There has been no change in the global production of oil over that period of time. And the, the, uh, uh, the facts are that in the year 2004, we sopped up all the additional, all the available uh, uh, spare capacity in the system. And uh, that has been the issue. That is the issue today. And it is clear to me that where you, when you look at the, at very little spare capacity in the system and you look at the ability of the of of uh, price to reflect the the increase in demand. If you have a one percent increase in demand, my economics friends tell me you have about a twenty-fold increase 
in price, so that for every 1 percent increase in demand, I've got a 20 percent increase in price. It's easy to see that we've got that kind of situation going on at the current time. Well, we've seen over the years 1 percent increase in demand, but we've never seen a spike like we have seen and that is, over the last that, year. And that is because in and, the year 2004, we, we sopped up all the additional capacity of the system. Mr. Secretary, what you are testifying here today is that you are not going to recommend to President Bush that he use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve as a weapon against Saudi Arabia, against OPEC, to tell them we are not going to stand on the sidelines and that we are going to actively send more oil into the marketplace. Uh, that over the next um, 10 years you might have a plan to drill uh, in wilderness areas in our country, but over the next 10 weeks this summer there is no plan that the Bush administration has uh, to reduce the price of oil. And the one weapon you have, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, a proven weapon of success against OPEC, you are not going to deploy, notwithstanding Saudi Arabia turning a deaf ear to President Bush's request last Friday. First of all, Saudi Arabia did increase the production of, by some 300,000. But not in, not in response to the President. They but said that is something they had already done. But think, in response assume, to the President. I assume they, that that is the case, but I don't know that. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, the, uh, but the situation is that the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is meant to be there as a protection for the American people. The American why, people right now are being, Mr. Secretary, the American people are being tipped upside down at the pumps and having I money understand. shaken out of their pockets. Uh, Ford just announced that they are going to cut 15 percent production in the manufacture of vehicles this year. Right. Airlines are declaring that they are on the verge of bankruptcy. The American people are under assault from the skyrocketing price of oil, and the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is the one <laughs> weapon in the short run we have to stop this bubble from continuing to ravage the American economy and the American people, and we must use it now. I disagree with you, sir. Well, I, I think it is a disagreement that is really going to hurt our economy. Uh, my time has expired. Uh, I, uh, I recognize now the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there is another way I think we can reduce the price at the pump, at least those of us that uh, I have to buy gas that has 10 percent ethanol in it, and that is, is repealing the tariff on imported ethanol, which is a protection for uh, uh, the U.S. ethanol industry that is reflected in the pump, uh, at least uh, in those of us who live in areas where there has to be this kind of a blend. Does the administration have any plans to reduce or eliminate that tariff? I think that the administration would, would uh, deal with the questions related to the tariff by working with Congress. We are happy to work with Congress about that, on that subject. Uh, doesn't the administration have the power to do this administratively, however? I don't believe so, sir. Okay, so it does require an act of Congress? I believe so, yes, it does. Well, if it does require an act of Congress, will the administration request that uh, we consider legislation to repeal this tariff? Uh, I don't have a, a, a good answer to that offhand, mm -hmm. but I'd be happy to get it for you. Well, uh, I would appreciate that. You know, I'm, uh, I'll give Mr. Markey some of my time since he used a bit of it uh, up in his, his round of questioning. But it seems to me that we ought to have everything on the table, and uh, we hear an awful lot of ranting about uh, big oil, and a lot of that ranting is deserved. But I also think that big corn has got a, 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 an ore in this equation as well uh, because of the protection against cheap ethanol coming into the market that is produced outside this country. Uh, I would just very strongly urge the administration to uh, put on a full court press to reduce the tariff and maybe at least with the 10 percent of the petroleum that uh, we get at the pump, uh, we can reduce the cost of that, which will bring down the total cost. I thank the gentleman. You will back to balance my time. The gentleman's time has uh, expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Your um, uh, phraseology here, I think, is important uh, when you talked about new energy realities that I think we are all trying to adjust to. Um, you have been clear. Uh, 
in your testimony and prior comments that we're, we're dealing with an, a global energy market that is being uh, affected by things that are happening around uh, the globe and that there is no one source. It's all sort of blended together. Um, and you just finished saying that results won't be immediate, that, that there are certain uh, lag time that's going to be required as these things work their way through the system and adjustments are made in production and whatnot. I'm curious if you have a perspective on, on what that lag time is before there are things that ripple their way through the energy production system, uh, six months, six years. Yeah. Um, what would be, you think in your uh, position would be a realistic time I think it, time vary. frame? it varies, sir, according to um, which, which form of energy you're, you're thinking about. On oil, uh, we have already, I think, seen a turn where for the first time we have, we have a turn in the percentage of oil that we import. For the first time in some years, it's declined. And uh, I think that that is an indicator that if the non-OPEC producers continue to, to do what they are intending to do, that uh, we will see a success there. Um, nuclear power, I would expect that we would see nuclear power and, and uh, the licensing of and the, the proposals for nuclear power um, uh, in, a, in a serious way. I think we now have four reactors that have been uh, Just uh, applied begging, for. I don't, I, my time is limited and I, I, right. I want to get at this notion of if we have a sense of lag time, are we talking months, years, on an overall energy situation? I think we're talking years. We're going to be talking a few years to see uh, it in, in, uh, uh, the, in biofuels, which is the whole question that the chairman raised the, the issue about. In biofuels, we are looking at, uh, uh, by the year 2012, that's four years out, okay. that we're going to have uh, biofuels, cellul cellulosic biofuels that will be cost competitive with corn. Okay. Well, we're, we're looking here from a historic perspective. Um, in uh, May of 2001, when your predecessor was on the Vice President's Energy Task Force, um, uh, their vision was uh, put in place, and uh, uh, at that time, uh, oil pri gas prices were $1.70. Um, in 2005, you said that 95 percent of the administration's energy policy had been implemented, and that we are looking at $2.07 a gallon for gasoline. Um, then we had the Energy Policy Act in August of 2005, uh, which uh, the President uh, claimed was going to make a big difference um, for every American. Um, a year later, there was a big celebration in the Department of Energy uh, after, uh, celebrating the first anniversary of the passage of that. Um, I'm trying to get a sense now. We've had the administration in control since 2001. You had a Congress that in the main was very much in agreement with the administration, uh, compliant, giving you what you wanted, and much of it was implemented, and it's been now six, seven years. Right. Uh, are the $4 a gallon prices that we're seeing now a result of the success of the energy policy that's been in the pipeline now for some seven not. years? I would say not, sir. I'd say, I would say, however, that we, that when I, you quoted me as saying that 95 percent of the, of the energy policy of the administration had been implemented. That is not correct. If that's the word you claim that I said. I don't recall having said okay. that. But then let me, re, let me reframe that. It's been seven years. You've had an administration that's gotten virtually everything that's wanted from Congress, it's been in place, and I grant you that it takes a year or two or three to work its way out. Uh, shouldn't we be seeing the results? Are we seeing the results of no, sir. the Bush well, energy we're policy? To, we are starting to see the results, yes. Just as I indicated that the percentage of, of oil that we are importing has started to turn, Th that, the, that the American public is fed up with the high prices. I recognize that. I am acutely aware of that. I hear about it every day. And uh, it is something that, that uh, you and I have in common. 
I'm sure. Uh, but it's, it's also something that I think uh, we are looking to uh, for decades. We have been 30 years without appropriate research having been done on renewable energy, on solar energy, on wind energy. And uh, it, this takes a long time to accomplish. And uh, so it is something that is, it is years away in my judgment. Thank you very much. Just for your records, um, my understanding is that you did say that on March 9, 2005. And if I'm in error, I, I, don't, I, rec I don't recall having well, said that. I'm giving you, I'm giving you, I'm giving you a specific date. If I'm in error, I will correct that. If you did not, in fact, say I, that I would on March 9, 2005. Thank you, sir. Okay. Gentleman's no. time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Secretary. Uh, I think you said several times that you expected the world to be operating in a carbon-constrained uh, economy at some point in the future. And I want to ask, um, is that something you believe should happen? Do you believe that we should be taking actions to deal with global warming to restrain the, the growth of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases? Or are you simply saying that you're resigned to that happening and, and you can't stop that no, from of happening? It should happen, and we are doing what we're doing, everything we know how to do to accomplish that. So you think we should be doing all we know how to be doing to accomplish a reduction in greenhouse gases? I, yes, I, I do. Great. I, I, agree, I do too. I think we might disagree on whether we're doing that, however. I want to ask you about a cap and trade system, which we know how to do because we invented it in the United States. It's worked marvelously in sulfur dioxide. Uh, with zero, probably net zero cost, the U.S. economy. Uh, Europe is now engaged in it on their second round that they've learned some lessons on, and they're now going to improve some of the stakes. We have, a, we have an American system that we know works. We have a system that has been proposed in the Senate. I believe it's passed the committee over there, and we have a proposal many of us in this dais are supporting here for a cap-and-trade system. Uh, to me, it is real clear that absent that, we won't be able to achieve the carbon constraint that you indicate is necessary. Um, last time you were here, I asked if you'd spoken to the President about the cap and trade system and you indicated you had not. Could you tell us what the administration plans are if we send you a cap and trade bill this year, whether the President will sign it, and, uh, and if you can describe the cap and trade system that the President will sign, we are most anxious to, to, to receive some leadership from the White House. The President, the President laid out issues related to greenhouse gas control that he would be prepared to support uh, reasonable and achievable goals uh, that uh, did not, uh, that encouraged the investment in new technology, that worked on nuclear power, that encouraged the use of coal, that all nations need to be included uh, in the program and that we remove trade barriers. Those were, as I recall it, those were his five or six different points. Um, and uh, he has laid that out. I will tell you, sir, that uh, I have now been in this administration seven and a half years, and uh, I have spent a lot of my time at Commerce and then at Treasury and now at Energy negotiating with the Chinese over the, their exchange rates. And we have made this much uh, progress. And uh, I would tell you that I think it's a mistake for the President to unilaterally declare what he is prepared to do prior to undertaking this whole uh, major economy um, meeting, series of meetings, which he has been doing. And uh, it is my view that uh, he is correct in, in uh, the way he's going about dealing with it. Well, that's some, excuse me, <laughs> didn't mean to jump <laughs> on you like that. Um, excuse me. That's very disappointing because essentially you've said that the President will not join us in embracing a carbon constrained um, effort in the United States during his remaining term of office. I didn't say that. Well, it's obviously we're not going to have a global agreement by January 20th, 2009. And what you've basically said is America is going to secede from its historic uh, destiny of leading the world in these matters and taking a back seat and refusing to act till China, you know, agrees. And I think that's a huge mistake for several reasons. Number one, 
you know, we didn't wait for China to develop democracy before we acted. We are the, the world's leader. We are the world, yeah. world's largest polluter. And we've got both a moral obligation to act, but more importantly, an economic opportunity here. I mean, I met people yesterday in my office that, you know, signed in solar thermal contracts for the so first solar thermal plants. Uh, right. We've got great strides in solar photovoltaic. We've got great strides in enhanced geothermal. We've got guys making all electric cars starting in June. We've got the young man I talked about signing a contract to electrify the whole state of Israel. But those people can't get the help of the White House to send a signal to the markets that they need to invest in these new companies because there's going to be a price on carbon. It's very, very disappointing. And um, I just have to tell you that, you know, when the world looks back at all of our terms here, I just wish you could spend the next few months figuring out how to achieve a constraint on carbon in the U.S. economy that can drive investment into these new technologies. I think we're missing a huge opportunity here. I'm very disappointed in, in your position. Well, you can comment. I, I, just, I would just say that the, that particular company that you mentioned, to my knowledge, they have gotten a lot of investment and that they are uh, they're pretty well fixed. That's Clearly, but the venture the capital community, I met with 12 of them here in an office, in fact, in this building two weeks ago, and they said, look, right. until as long as the fossil fuel guys can put their pollution in the sky for free in unlimited amounts, we're not going to get this job done. You're letting the guys, it's like putting their garbage in a dump truck, back it up to the city hall parking lot and dump it all for free. As long as the fossil fuel guys can do that, we're not going to get the quantum leap we need so we lead the world and become the arsenal of clean energy like we were the arsenal in freedom. It's, it's very disappointing. We're going to have to do work starting in January. Thank you. Okay. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Hersas Sandler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, late last year, the results of a study co sponsored by your department were released supporting the possibility of mid range ethanol blends, such as E20 or E30, uh, that can enhance fuel economy for some non flex fuel vehicles. And an update last month from the Department on its intermediate ethanol blends testing recognizes the urgent need for continued and expanded testing based on the new RFS and the anticipated saturation of the E10 market. The update reports that the Department will have at least 160 test vehicles online this month, and I'm glad to see is also evaluating the effects of higher ethanol blends on smaller engines such as pressure washers. So two questions. When do you expect definitive results on the effect of intermediate ethanol blends on most engine families? And has the Department considered evaluating higher ethanol blends over E20? Uh, to my knowledge, we have not considered, uh, to take your second question first, to, uh, we have not considered above E20, uh, and we are testing uh, various engines for E15 and E20, uh, and, that's the, that's, and that would be enough to encourage the development of the ethanol industry. The concern is that we, with the concentration of the production of ethanol only in the Midwest, that uh, we will not uh, encourage the, the nationwide uh, adoption of uh, ethanol, and we need to do that, uh, and that the way to, a way to stimulate that uh, would be to increase the availability of E15 and E20. So uh, is there is so th what exactly I'm not sure I follow what the concern is about testing E30 at the same time. We can test anything, but the, the, the E20 is enough to get us through the beyond the saturation the, of the E10 the, market. The, the, the whole issue related to E10. And then when do you expect those definitive results? I don't, have a, I don't have a quick answer for you on that, and I'd be happy to get it for you. Okay, if you could. Sure. Uh, on wind energy, uh, I was encouraged on to see wind, wind, energy? wind yes. Yeah. You, your department released its 20 percent report earlier this month, concluding yeah. that wind energy right. could contribute as much as 20 percent of the nation's electricity by 2030 without, while significantly reducing the carbon footprint. And Assistant Secretary Andrew Karsner was quoted as saying that this can happen for less than half a cent a kilowatt hour. So what do you think are the key steps Congress must take this year and next to make this possible? And what do you think is key to facilitating the siting of new transmission infrastructure, given that the report also states uh, that transmission must be categorized with the interstate highway system? 
Well, I think the, the, the issue related to uh, transmission is something that uh, we would encourage. I think we have enough tools to encourage that. Uh, we have uh, the so-called electricity office uh, of, uh, I think it's energy reliability and electricity delivery. And uh, that office, uh, headed by Kevin Kolovar, is, uh, I just had a session with them night before last uh, with an advisory committee that uh, represents those from all over America dealing with this question. So I think we have, uh, uh, you know, we, and I, to my knowledge, we do not need uh, work from Congress, but I would be happy to come back to you again if, if that uh, proves to be uh, otherwise. So you're confident that there is enough incentives that currently exist for private investment alone to I move so. forward with the building of the transmission I capacity? So. I think so. Based on, based on my discussions with the participants in that, in that uh, industry. How about the production tax credits? Would you favor the extension of the production tax credit for wind energy production? Uh, uh, there again, I'm happy to we we'll be happy to work with Congress to to uh, do that. Sure. Do you think that that's key in order to get to the point where we it can have we can meet the 20 percent? It would appear that it is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. General lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I just want to get some uh, clear up something that I'm not sure. Uh, was clear earlier uh, when you responded to Mr. Blumenauer. Uh, are, are you saying or suggesting that uh, Saudi Arabia agreed to uh, increase production to 300,000 barrels a day as a result of the request from President Bush? I do not know. I don't know that. I haven't been told that. So I don't have, an, I don't have a, a, a quick answer for you. I do know that they did agree that day, apparently, uh, according to I guess the chairman, uh, that was not uh, they were they were that was something that they'd already agreed on uh, uh, ahead of time. I don't know. Yeah, that, that was my understanding, and so I, I just wanted to get that, guess, get that cleared I don't, I don't up. Know. Uh, the um, the Saudis um, have responded to the request by the president uh, by saying that the price of oil is impacted more by the weakened U.S. dollar than anything else. Uh, uh, do you agree with, with their assessment? No, sir, I don't. Why not? For the reasons that I just mentioned, that production has been flat for the last three years, having had a big jump up the, um, in 2004. Uh, when, whenever you have a situation where we know that demand is increasing, demand from China, demand from India, and even a small increase from here, uh, that uh, we, when you have a situation like that, you can get the current kind of pricing environment that where you have flat production and you have very little um, uh, upside in terms of, uh, of availability. It, it seems to me that the market is madly searching for any excuse to raise the price uh, of oil. I, I can't comment on that, sir. Well, I mean, every, every you know, the price of oil appears to be uh, raised when, uh, on all events, you know, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's uh, a loss by the uh, Washington Nationals, uh, I mean, whatever happens, it seems as if, you know, they raise the price of oil. Fortunately, the Nationals seem to be losing a lot, so that... Uh, yeah, they, they, they ran out of gas early, but the... the <laughs> but the... I'm, I'm just... I mean, it, you know, I mean, you mentioned Katrina earlier. Uh, you know, the, the administration seems to think that to solve the problem, we just drill in uh, the... Uh, uh, wildlife refuge, uh, you know, the, the Saudis say it's the weakened U.S. dollar. I mean, uh, that's not what I said. I said that we need, we need everything. We need not, not just, so this isn't going to yield to 
uh, to uh, uh, drilling in, in Anwar or any other place. I think I acknowledge that in my opening remarks. We need everything. We need, we need uh, solar energy. We need wind. We need, uh, uh, we need uh, nuclear power. We need biofuels. We need coal, carbon capture, sequestration, all of it in order to deal with this issue. M greater nuclear, nuclear uh, uh, pa uh, power? Yes, sir. Uh, do you have some uh, suggestions on where we will store the, the waste? We have, are working very hard on the whole Yucca Mountain program. Uh, and uh, next, uh, I guess it's two weeks, uh, two we or a week from next Monday or Tuesday or so, we are, we are scheduled to uh, file the uh, application. Uh, uh, so you're going to go ahead in spite of the fact that all the Nevada members of Congress and, uh, and the governor are all opposed? I am going ahead because I am acting as the, the agent of Congress and the presidency, as, uh, as best I know. Congress has opined on this matter, as well as the administration, and our job is to execute. Yeah, the, 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 the point is, where, where are you from? This is a filing of a license with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. As a, I mean, do you support the construction of new uh, nuclear facilities? Yes, I do. Where? Where? Yes, sir. That's something to be looked at on a state-by-state -state basis, wherever the states decide they want to put them. Uh, and you're including your state? I am including, I'm a resident of the district, but I, I don't think that there is likely to be any being put in the district. Now, the, the, you know, the, uh, the uh, praise of the Bengal tiger uh, increases with the distance from the jungle. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. The gentleman's thank you, time has expired. Um, the chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, New York State, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, a couple of observations. I think you said that the administration between 2001 and 2008 has spent about $45 billion on uh, measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And if First I got... On, it was on both the science and the technology. Right. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. I just wanted to point out it's a little bit less than four months of what we're spending in Iraq. Just as a matter of, I know this is uh, off topic. I'm not asking you to comment on that, but I just think in terms of national priorities, it's important to say it. I um, and you also said at one point during your testimony that the results from many of these uh, technologies we're looking at are not going to be immediate. Uh, you also said each of us has a part to play. That's correct. Uh, and I would suggest that if each of us, uh, perhaps you as Secretary of Energy might make a statement or you know, the President uh, in his position of uh, a bully pulpit can make a statement that it's patriotic, not just wise in terms of climate and the economy, but patriotic to uh, drive in the most fuel efficient manner possible, drive the most fuel efficient vehicle, buy the most fuel efficient vehicle uh, possible, uh, try to, uh, uh, to use as little energy as you can. Uh, th and that actually would have an immediate impact. Uh, you, you agree or? I agree with that. Uh, so there, there are some things that can have an immediate impact. I agree. I, I think that's probably And even right. a short-term impact, like, for instance, uh, the Idaho National Laboratory has done studies of low-head hydro sites in, I believe, all of the states, but in particular those states that have uh, changes in elevation that, that lend themselves to it. In New York, uh, the Idaho uh, Laboratory's website shows 4,000 some low head hydroelectric sites, small dams and uh, waterfalls that are currently not being used for hydro generation and estimates that greater than 1,200 megawatts of power could be harvested by putting turbines where water is already falling and wiring that into the grid, uh, something that would have a, a short term effect. Uh, I would guess a serious effort, a, a top priority effort to harness this unused hydropower, which by the way would hire uh, mechanics and electrical workers and, uh, you know, tradespeople to do the insulation and, of course, 
has the advantage of not being a single large point source, but being a lot of small point sources that would be spread, spread out over the grid, um, would, would in fact hire a lot of people besides generating a lot of power. I just wanted to throw that out as something. I, I agree with all that. So maybe we could work with the administration to try to make that happen. I, I, uh, I, I don't know. I'm sure there are liability issues with some of these dams that are orphan dams and so on, or some, uh, uh, you know, may need to be indemnified and repaired. But if we can indemnify the nuclear industry, I suggest we should put renewables on the same footing. Either none of them get indemnified or we look at uh, helping the ones that, that need it. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the um, there was one uh, aspect of the administration's budget that I was curious about. Uh, the committee has explored the potential to make massive improvements in efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions by making buildings more efficient. Right. Uh, and um, actually, I commend uh, my friend from California and his state's efforts to reduce electrical consumption. While the rest of the country has had this curve going upward, uh, California has sort of wiggled around and kept constant, mostly constant, for the last 20 years uh, because they have had stricter standards than the other states have had. And I think we should be emulating them rather than making them conform to a, a looser standard. But at any rate, in the most recent budget, DOE has zeroed out the weatherization assistance program, right. um, and which would help those most in need uh, by simultaneously boosting efficiency and cutting their energy costs. And by the way, employing a lot of people. Weatherization hires tradespeople to put in storm doors, storm windows, insulation, et cetera. So what is the DOE's rationale for eliminating funding for this it's, program? It's simple. I, w I was the one that made the decision. And so if, you, if, I'm, if there's a bad guy, I'm the guy. And uh, the, the issue there was um, the, the ret we are largely a technically driven uh, science and engineering organization. That's what we know how to do. We're experts at that. We're very good at it. We're not all these national labs. Two-thirds of all the employees of the Energy Department work in the National Laboratory. And they're very good at this. Um, the, uh, the issue, therefore, get, gets to be uh, what kind of return do we get for our money? We make, as best we now know, uh, the number I was given is that we have a 20 for 1 return on investments in, tech, on, in technology. I got a 1.5 return uh, for the, what the weatherization program. It was strictly a financial matter. Uh, well, you're very honest, and th uh, thank you for, uh, for your candor. Uh, I would just close by saying that 35 years ago, my next-door neighbor in the Hudson Valley, a Vietnam veteran and entrepreneurial soul uh, named Jan Aswood, was lighting uh, balloons full of hydrogen in his backyard and calling up the press and trying to get them to come and see that he was making hydrogen from a barrel of water, a photovoltaic cell, and two electrodes in the water, and uh, collecting hydrogen and singeing the hair off his arm by lighting these balloons full of hydrogen. But as a demonstration that a renewable, any kind of renewable com combined with water could use hydrogen as a storage device for, uh, for energy. And it seems to me that, that citing such a uh, facility to both store hydrogen, which we now know how to handle much better than we did uh, when the Hindenburg went down and is sort of the, the Three Mile Island of the hydrogen era. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we have the space shuttle powered by it. We know how to uh, handle it much more safely. And it seems to me it would be much easier to site a hydrogen storage and generation facility that produces no waste except water when you burn the hydrogen than it would be to site a new nuclear plant. And then, in fact, you are looking for the same site. You are looking for a place away from population on a body of water. So um, I am just curious, you know, how 35 years have gone by and since I saw my next door neighbor doing that and we haven't seen. Um, more of an effort in that direction. And, and uh, my time is up, so okay. I yield. No, the, the, the Secretary may answer the question, please. Uh, the, answer, the answer to that question is we have been through over the last 35 years a real dip in the fact that oil all of a sudden went from the outlandish price of 30 to 35 dollars, which it was in 1978, down to 10 or 8 or 9, something like that. All work in this area, in research area, stopped at that point in time. Everything. And uh, it was, that's been, that's the issue we're dealing with. 
gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to follow up on an earlier question, although your question deserves following up too, uh, Mr. Hall. Uh, Ms. Uh, Hertha Sandlin uh, mentioned that uh, the department had just issued a report a couple weeks ago that wind energy could provide 20 percent of our nation's electrical needs by uh, 2030. And yet uh, the Department of Energy's proposed budget reduce, uh, increases the wind energy uh, research by only $3 million. Now, this is a budget that was decimated over the period between 2000 and 2006. Uh, so what is the justification for such a low level of funding for such a, an important part of our nation's energy supply? To my knowledge, a, a lot of the work that has been done uh, has already been accomplished in order to create uh, electricity from wind. Uh, that is one uh, answer. And two, there continues to be a very substantial commitment to in both uh, Massachusetts, where Mr. Markey is from, and in Texas. Uh, the, the relating to a uh, uh, new uh, wind um, blade test facilities. And so there, are, there is work going on. Uh, I guess I would answer that if research work needs to be done, that is what we are good at. That is what we do, is research work, research and development. Well, to go, we, uh, don't, uh, we don't fund new... To go from uh, 1 or 2 percent of our nation's energy to, to 20 percent, is a huge jump. I mean, that is as much more or maybe more than nuclear is producing. So I suggest that uh, additional research is going to be needed to meet that level of demand or that level of production. Um, my second question would be, uh, do you agree that there are tremendous gains to be made with energy efficiency? Yes, I do. Then would you agree to work within the administration to allow states to lead the nation uh, in efficiency legislation, even though um, it may exceed federal standards, especially referring to vehicle efficiency? I can't commit to that because I don't understand all the details of it. I'd be happy to uh, study that particular question. Well, what I'm asking is would you advocate that? Because uh, California has, uh, and Massachusetts and other states have had trouble getting the administration to allow that sort of legislation to, uh, to go forward. Uh, and uh, honestly, if you uh, don't agree to that, then, you know, by uh, association, the administration stands uh, in, a po in opposition to the most, I believe, the most effective tool we have to lowering gas prices in the long run. Okay. All right. Good. I, I like that kind of agreement. Um, uh, now, you had mentioned to Mr. Blumenauer uh, that, um, you don't remember mentioning a 95 percent success in implementing the administration's energy policies. That's correct. But uh, on the White House website, it shows that you have said that over the past four years, we have implemented 95 percent of those recommendations, 100 recommendations that are made. Uh, so that indicates, in my mind, uh, that the administration's policies are flawed because they have been implemented to a large degree uh, and the success in terms of keeping gas uh, uh, prices low uh, for whatever method by increasing efficiency or by increasing supply have not been as successful. Do you have a response to that? Well, I think that, you know, the, re the response is that we clearly have a long-term research program in solar energy, wind, nuclear power, biofuels carbon capture sequestration, and it is going to take a number of years to dig ourselves out of the hole that we are in. And so the fact that I am quoted as having said that this is 95 percent done, if I am quoted correctly by, by the Congressman, I am wrong. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Yes, Biden. The gentleman's time has expired. And, uh, there is going to be a series of roll calls in a few more minutes, and I think what might be advisable is if we could continue to question the Secretary until uh, that time has arrived. So the Chair will recognize himself for another round of questions. Uh, Mr. Secretary, last Friday the President was in Saudi Arabia, um, and at that time he and uh, Secretary uh, Rice um, uh, reached a, an agreement and a memorandum of understanding. Uh, which is, and, and I quote here from the agreement, 
intended to cooperate um, uh, uh, on the issue of, uh, of uh, appropriately sized light water nuclear reactors and fuel services arrangements for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, promoting the establishment of arrangements that would allow future civilian light water nuclear reactors uh, deployed in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia with access to reliable nuclear fuel supplies and services. Now, I don't understand, Mr. Secretary. Um, three years ago, Vice President Cheney said um, that, and I, and I quote, here's what he said, talking about Iran's deeply questionable nuclear program. He said, Iran is already sitting on an awful lot of oil and gas. No one can figure why they need nuclear as well to generate energy. So if that's true for Iran, why are we in the United States introducing yet more nuclear uh, technology into the Middle East when we know that has been a source for much of the friction uh, that exists in that region because ultimately any country can pull out of the nuclear proliferation regime, hold on to the uranium, hold on to the plutonium, and have a nuclear weapons program with the very same uh, uh, light water reactor materials. Why, Mr. Secretary, I, is the President? I, I, I don't know. I wasn't there, and so I can't, uh, I can't respond to that other than saying I presume that the President has a good deal of confidence in, in the King and in the, the leadership of Saudi Arabia. It is also true that uh, it is going on in the United Arab Emirates where they have expressed a lot of interest in, uh, in nuclear power, in solar energy, in all manner of other things. Well, that is the point, things. Mr. Secretary. Um, Saudi Arabia is three times the size of Texas. Yes. It is one big desert. It is sunny almost every day of the year. Right. Why aren't we having a Saudi solar cooperation agreement with the United States? Why would we introduce more dangerous nuclear materials into that region when solar energy should be the basis of our partnership with a country that says it wants to diversify from oil and gas, although Mr. Cheney would say if Iran has plenty of oil for 75 million people, uh, Saudi Arabia has twice as much for a third of the population. Why would we introduce more nuclear power? Does that make any sense, given the volatility of that region and the ability to have solar become the future for Saudi Arabia if they want to end their oil and gas era? I can't answer that, uh, Mr. Chairman. I don't know. I wasn't there. You know, I know this sounds uh, I'm incredulous. I can't believe that the President's Secretary of Energy doesn't have a view uh, or have knowledge about the nuclear agreement that the United States is implementing uh, with the Saudi Arabians, uh, given the fact that it's your agency that is touting new research in solar, new research in renewable energy resources, that you seem to be out of the loop in terms of then what is the energy policy for what our agreement should be around the world. That's true. It's true. Yes. I just find that hard to believe. It seems as though the Secretary of State can use nuclear power plants as a short-term diplomatic tool for her use, knowing that solar energy is a better alternative for Saudi Arabia, for sure, uh, and that our long history with transfer of nuclear materials into uh, these Middle Eastern countries almost inevitably results uh, in the compromise of that program and the use of those materials sure, for our nuclear weapons I, program. I am sure that Secretary Rice was uh, not uh, contemplating the fact that, th these, that this program would be compromised. I mean, you are assuming that it is going to be compromised. I, I am saying to you that I'm if you look it, at I'm assuming that it's not. If you look at Saudi Arabia, you have to say that solar should be the first resort of that country. 
And instead, we are sending them more nuclear power plants, the same way that the world sent Iraq and Iran and North Korea nuclear power plants that ultimately turned uh, as um, energy sources into weapons programs. Uh, we know the tension that exists between the Saudis and the Iranians. Um, we know that they are trepidatious about the nuclear weapons program in Iran. Right. I don't understand why we would be fueling this tension in the Middle East by providing uh, uh, the beginnings of a program where we will send nuclear materials to, the, to Saudi Arabia uh, under the guise of an energy exchange, when my, when my real fear here is that the Bush administration knows uh, that this program is likely to be compromised in the future by the Saudis. I don't uh, believe that. I don't believe that, sir. Well, they should know it, well, given that that's, we have a difference of view. Well, what, do you? Well, how about this? Why don't, can we have an agreement that there should be a Saudi solar agreement with the United States, and that we should be sharing our Arabia, solar technology with the Saudi Arabia Arabians? Would like to have a solar agreement? Uh, they certainly can ask us, and we would be happy to. Respond. But aren't you suspicious that the Saudis don't want a solar agreement it, because they are Mr. the Saudi? Markey. Saudi Arabia is the Saudi Arabia of solar. There it is. It sits there as a desert with yes. sun tw 12 months a year, blistering hot. Why wouldn't this administration be suspicious that they're asking for nuclear rather than solar power exchange uh, in order to meet their long term energy needs? There are a lot of good reasons to use nuclear power. It is less expensive than solar energy right now. We don't have, we don't have uh, solar energy that is cost competitive. You know, do you personally believe that Saudi Arabia needs, more, needs nuclear power plants? I believe that it is wise for them to diversify their sources of energy away from oil and gas, yes. You know, here's the problem, Mr. Secretary, and I don't think the Bush administration is ever going to understand this, that every nuclear power plant is a generator of electricity, yes it is, but with a byproduct uh, of nuclear materials that can be used for a nuclear bomb program. And that's what's going on in Saudi Arabia. Well, that's uh, and the Bush administration That is your opinion, sir. I know it is my opinion, but all Middle Eastern history points in that direction. And the Bush administration should be touting the dramatic breakthroughs that have been made in solar energy over the last couple of years and encouraging the Saudis to move in that direction given their geographic location, the desert nature have, of their population and the leadership role that we can play in partnership with them in pointing the world in that direction and away from this nuclear fuel cycle which is ultimately going to come back and haunt the world once again. Let me turn and uh, recognize the gentleman from uh, Oregon, uh, Mr. Blumenau. Thank you. Um, the uh, Vice President uh, famously said in 2001 that conservation may be a sign of personal virtue, but it is not a basis, sufficient basis for a sound, comprehensive energy policy. Uh, is that still the Administration's view? That uh, conservation is a personal virtue and is not a cornerstone of certainly the sound? not. It's certainly not my view. I was curious, um, as you uh, moved forward uh, early in your tenure to implement the the recommendations of Mr. Cheney's national energy policy, um, and Again, uh, our understanding is that um, the, the, the assertion was that much of those recommendations were in fact implemented, uh, which as my colleague mentioned a moment ago, you were quoted as saying on the, on the White House website. Um, yet according to the GAO, the Department of Energy has missed 30, missed 34 of the 34 congressionally mandated deadlines for setting new efficiency standards for appliances and electrical equipment. Why was meeting those efficiency standards such a low priority of the Department of Energy that they missed 
34 I out can't, of 34. I, I can't answer that. I can tell you that um, one of the things that I have focused on during my three plus years of uh, work in that department uh, has been management and has been the issue of uh, trying to run things better. And uh, we have, uh, I think, have turned that around and have that entire program now in better shape. It's still going to be a number of years before we get caught up, but we now have it on a program that I think makes sense. It, to write a, an appliance standard is a much more difficult task than it appears to be on the surface. And uh, it, is, it takes time. You've got to then get agreement of, the, of both the, the manufacturing community and the regulatory community and others that are involved. And well, so we, and it's your choice to get the agreement of the manufacturing community. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, the administration stepped in and stopped some of the stronger standards that were already under underway by the Clinton administration. I, not to my knowledge. I don't know about that. I can't speak to it. Air conditioning standards? I can't you don't speak know to that, that, that your I department stopped the implementation of more rigorous air conditioning standards? Do I know that? No, I don't. Okay. Um, I mean, that would, I would think that that would be part of, if you're getting a handle on the management and you were concerned that they, we missed 34 right. out of 34 standards, right. that there might, and it's so hard to get agreement, that these would be things that would be pretty high priority for you to know. I don't happen to know about air conditioning standards. I don't happen to well, know. What are your them. priorities for efficiency? I mean, air conditioning, I think, is, it, is number one or number two in every area of the country. Furnaces, uh, they are, they are very important in the south. They are less important in the north. Furnaces are very important. Uh, there are all kinds of dishwashers. Uh, refrigerators. I mean, it just, it, it's a long list of things. Air conditioning is number one or number two in every major region of the country, is it not? Uh, not to my knowledge. I don't happen to know that offhand. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. The gentleman's uh, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I want to ask you again about this cap and trade system. Um, m many, if not most, of the investment community, um, the cap organization, which are several Fortune 500 companies that have been urging your administration to embrace a cap and trade system, they believe it's necessary both from an environmental and an economic standpoint. And the people I'm listening to are the people in these cutting edge companies who are developing advanced solar photovoltaics, right. enhanced geothermal, um, wave power, solar thermal plants, a whole host of new technology, the electrification of the automobile. What they tell me is that we are missing an economic opportunity by not adopting a cap and trade system. And what they tell me is, is that we are in a race we're in a race against Germany, Denmark, Spain to see who's going to be developing these technologies to sell to China and India. India, when I was there, they have 400 million people that don't have access to a light bulb. They're going to want electricity. Right. The question is, who's going to provide them the clean energy technologies to do that? Is it going to be us or is it going to be Spain or Germany? And right now we're losing out to those countries because they have policies that drive investment into these clean energy technologies. Now, that's what the clean energy CEOs and the investment community is telling me. Why do they get this and, and this administration not get this as seeing this as an economic opportunity for us and why we should lead the world? Why do they see, understand that and your administration does not understand that? I don't know how to answer it any differently than I, and that I pardon me, than I've already answered it, uh, Mr. Inslee. I think the, the question gets to be uh, how do we bring all of the countries of the world together. And the President has, I think, wisely uh, developed a program for, uh, for uh, getting the largest, I think it's the largest 17 or 18 economies, the major economies of the world, 
to get them together to make an agreement on what the approach, what the world's goal ought to be and what each country's goal ought to be and he will be, be prepared to commit to that at that point in time. And there is a G8 meeting that is supposed to occur, I think, in early July. And uh, if there is successful, if we are successful in getting a response from the other countries, uh, this country will respond accordingly. Well, clearly, we, you know, we all have a stake in this and everybody needs to act at some point. But there's two major flaws with that. Number one, if we would adopted the Bush administration model of democracy, we would still be you know, trying to reach a global goal of everybody becoming a democracy before we just went ahead and did it in 1776 because we decided to lead the world. And I think that's the policy of America that we ought to be leading the world. But secondly, and just as more importantly, this strategy, if you call it that, of the administration is we don't do anything until, you know, Bangladesh signs on to an agreement uh, the, is a huge, huge economic failure because we are not going to develop the clean energy technologies to sell to the world if we wait for the entire world to get on board. I look at this as losing an economic opportunity while we'll wait for the rest of the world. And I just don't know why the administration cannot understand that of what it is to lose economic opportunity. Why, why don't you don't, agree with this? I don't know how this? to be any, any clearer than it was. These are the major economies of the world. I think there are 17 or 18 of them. They include places like China, India, Brazil, Mexico, uh, and they, they, we are making some progress. Good so you're willing, you're, you're willing to, to, to give away a market to sell China clean energy technology. You want, you're willing to no. give that away to Spain and Germany who are now taking advantage of our failure to act on this. I, not in my view. Well, that's what's happening. Germany, you know, we used to be the leader in solar photovoltaic. Now right. Germany is, and the reason is they've adopted a cap and trade system. They've adopted a feed-in tariff, something I'll be introducing shortly, and we've dropped back, back to number five or six. And now they are leading in selling product to China because this administration has failed to act and they're giving away those markets. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York State. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Hall. Chairman uh, and Mr. Secretary. Thank you for uh, um, this conversation. Uh, our office in uh, Putnam County, New York, in the 19th District received a call lately from a woman who was all excited about buying a flex fuel vehicle. And she asked my staff, where can I get some flex fuel? And we had to tell her there are only a couple of pumps in New York State, even though there are more than 200,000 vehicles, I believe, sold by Ford and GM. Uh, we've sort of induced people to, uh, to build vehicles that can burn E85, uh, allowed them to advertise it on TV as a green thing to do. You can help the environment by buying an E85 car right. and, and allowed the oil companies uh, to continue to not provide uh, uh, that kind of blend. In fact, when the oil executives, the top CEOs of the five top companies came before this committee, I asked them in my brief questions, now that you have made the biggest profit in the history of the world, of any corporation in the world, would you commit to putting one, at least one biofuels pump at every station that you own? not franchise stations, but stations that you actually own. And every one of them said no. And I said, why? And they said, we don't know if the demand will be there. And I said, haven't you heard of flex fuel vehicles? Uh, haven't you heard of advertising? Um, I think they may need some help from your department. And I know that, it's, that you're all, you know, PhDs and researchers and that, uh, you know, things like this or efficiency uh, or weatherization may be fall below the level of interest of a lot of people who work at the Department of Energy. But we have a situation where last week uh, I checked on the internet, ethanol was selling for a buck ninety-seven. It's gone up a little bit this week, but it's still somewhere between half and a third the price of gasoline. So uh, if we've got these vehicles on the road, we've incentivized uh, a incentivized uh, a production capacity. Some of which, by the way, is in danger of going bankrupt, and and new ethanol or cellulosic ethanol projects are in danger of not being built because they're seen as weakening in the market. What can we do or what can your department do uh, to uh, make sure that the infrastructure exists to bring that uh, fuel to market? Because that would have an immediate impact we on the work, price of we fuel. We can work and are working with the oil companies as well as the auto companies to get more flex fuel vehicles made and to get the oil companies to, um, to include 
uh, the, uh, the, the NE85 pump and or other, uh, uh, other pumps available. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I, I hope that works as fast as possible, and I'm proud to say that West Point in my uh, district, after some discussion uh, with the commander of the post uh, uh, and his staff, have decided to put in a 5,000-gallon E85 uh, uh, tank underground and to sell uh, that fuel to flex fuel vehicles in their motor pool and at the commissary uh, where the faculty in the West Point community buy fuel. And the more we can do to especially have these large uh, facilities that move large quantities, like uh, school bus uh, f fleets that might be able to burn a blend of biodiesel uh, or uh, UPS or you know big shipping companies and so on, uh, to pull the string through the tube so that there's more demand to help create uh, more production on the other end. And I would encourage you uh, to do everything you can to try to make thank that happen. Thank you very happen. much. I thank you. I'll yield back. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired and all time has expired. Um, Mr. Secretary, we, well, we thank you so much for coming here uh, today. Um, we know that you have an unenviable task. You are the President's principal energy advisor, uh, and, uh, and you have the responsibility of defending indefensible positions, uh, which are created by President Bush and Vice President Cheney. And we recognize the difficulty of the position which you're placed in here, uh, because those positions are indefensible. On the, again, in, in conclusion, on, on the issue of deploying the Strategic Petroleum Reserve beginning this Memorial Day weekend, you're arguing that there is no natural disaster. President Bush argues that uh, there is no international crisis uh, in the Middle East, and therefore the conditions do not exist that would require the deployment of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. I could not disagree more. I think we are in an economic crisis right now. It is largely fueled by high oil prices that are affecting consumers, affecting business all across our country. You are right. It is not a natural disaster created oil spike. It is a Bush administration driven price spike in oil and gas. They have had no. That I, disagree they, they have, with that. I know you disagree. Okay. But all evidence points to the fact that oil has gone from $30 a barrel to $135 a barrel during the seven and a half years that President Bush and Vice President Cheney uh, have been implementing their secret energy plan. And that secret energy plan is one that has not included the robust investment in renewable energy resources, wind and solar. The administration is still opposing uh, the extension of the wind and solar energy tax breaks. And even as we hit the Memorial Day weekend, the Bush administration is still refusing to sell oil from our Strategic Petroleum Reserve as a way of sending a signal to the marketplace that we are not going to stand on the sidelines. We are going to actively intervene to protect consumers and businesses. And I understand your position. Uh, you are in a difficult one uh, as the Secretary of Energy when the President and Vice President are committed to ending their administration as they began it uh, without a real energy policy. And, uh, uh, and, it, and it's bad news for our economy, um, but uh, I think drivers should expect as they head to gas stations across the country today and tomorrow to get ready, ready for the Memorial Day weekend uh, to pay the highest prices that any Americans have ever pray, paid uh, for uh, oil at the pump. And I think it is the responsibility of the Bush administration to deploy the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in order to protect them. Again, Mr. Secretary, I thank you for being here. Uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned. In a few moments, the spiritual leader of Tibet, the Dalai Lama, 
speaks about human rights in Tibet and China with members of the British Parliament. 